So first of all, I think uh, I actually have nothing to add to the previous speaker. I just should leave and we should call a conference quits. <laughs> Seriously, this is the hardest act to follow ever in my whole career. Um, I don't even know how to recover from this. So what I want to do is I want to take you to the future. Um, I'm obsessed with the future, and I'm obsessed with technology and how technology can solve, hopefully, solve some of the world's biggest problems. I want to take you on a journey. And I've got about 25 minutes, and normally I teach this in a week-long executive program. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to compress a week's worth of content for which we charge 14,500 US dollars down into 25 minutes and I give it to you for free. So please, please buckle your seatbelts. I will speak a little faster. The one thing and the only thing I want you to remember from this whole talk, literally the only thing is that tomorrow will look dramatically different than today. And I'm not talking tomorrow five years from now. I'm talking tomorrow 24 hours later, and we'll explore this in a second. And if you have been to the uh, opening session this morning, um, which was my introduction to conscious capitalism, uh, this conference, um, you have already seen one particular graph, which is this here. This is um, the so-called exponential graph, and we talk a lot about exponentiality at Singularity University, and I'll tell you in a minute why this is so important. Um, keep this graph in mind. This graph uh, is your classic exponential trend. It's a doubling every time period, one, two, four, eight, sixteen. Uh, if you draw it, it's the, what we call the hockey stick curve. Uh, I live in Silicon Valley. If you ever want to pitch a business in Silicon Valley, this is your revenue slide. So feel free to take a picture. All you need to do is you need to put some numbers against it, right? I'm not joking. I'm a, I, was a, I was a venture capitalist, and literally this is the revenue slide. And of course, the most important and probably best known exponential trend is what is called Moore's Law. Gordon Moore, co-founder of Intel 50 years ago, um, observed the past and wrote a paper and said that what he believes to be true is that we double the number of transistors on an integrated circuits every two years. Um, and he said back in the day, 50 years ago, he said, I believe this to be true for the next 10 to 20 years. Um, this has been true for the last 50 years. And what this leads to is, of course, computers get effectively twice as fast every two years, or they get half the price at the size, uh, same price performance ratio. To put this into a little bit of uh, perspective, computing goes currently into two interesting directions. The one is it goes very, very big, supercomputing style, huge computing. Uh, this is a computer which was released in 1997 called ASCII Red. It cost 55 million US dollars, was roughly the size, a little bit smaller than this room, roughly the size of a tennis court, um, and was the very first computer to break through the one teraflop barrier. A teraflop is a uh, trillion floating point operations per second. So imagine you would do two plus two in your head a trillion times in one second. Incredibly powerful computer, very, very remarkable computer at the time, was used by the US military to simulate um, the uh, radioactive fallout of a World War III, as well as doing some relatively complex weather calculations. So this is 1997. Nine years later, you walk into Best Buy, you buy a Sony PlayStation 3, costs you $499, 2.1 teraflops. This is what Moore's Law does to you. You go from, in within nine years, you go from Nation states use something, use a computer to simulate World War III to your kids play World War III on a big screen television, right? So this is what's happening in computing. The other side of computing, which is equally as important and equally as exciting, is super small computing, tiny computing, Internet of Things. Um, this is a computer called Pi Zero, came out in 2015, cost five US dollars. This is a full-scale computer. You can put a memory in there, your keyboard and a mouse in there, you um, and you can run Windows on this machine, five US bucks. Now, for the price of a venti Starbucks latte, you get the compute power of two and a half Cray-1 supercomputers. The Cray-1 was released in 1975-ish. Each of the Cray-1s, and the Cray-1 was really the first real supercomputer we had in the world. Each of these Cray-1s had more compute power than we had total to put the man on the moon. All of NASA's compute power together is less than one of those Cray ones. So now for the price of a venti Starbucks latte, at least in Silicon Valley, you get two and a half times the compute power we had to put the man on the moon. Of course, you need to believe we ever put a man on the moon. Just saying. <laughs> We're located on the NASA grounds, so I might have access to files. Anyway. And to put this into another perspective, this is a uh, golf ball. In the golf ball, you see a dimple. In the gilt dimple, you see a small chip. That chip is 1.6 by 2 millimeters. It's a full-scale computer, costs 75 cents. This chip is the sole reason, and there's many others like it now. This is a full-scale computer. 
This chip is the sole reason why anything and everything which has an electric core today will become smart. There's absolutely no question. I get people asking me, why would I want to have a smart toaster? And God knows I don't need a smart toaster, but I can tell you, you will get one. And the sole reason is you get it for free. Intel, sorry, Cisco, until very recently said that by the year 2020, there's going to be about 20 billion of these devices in the world. Three months ago, Cisco came out and said, we were so wrong, we think it's going to be 50 billion. So in the next three years, we'll have 50 billion of these devices. So computing gets in a really interesting way. Ray Kurzweil, one of our co-founders, formulated something called the Law of Accelerating Returns, which is based on Moore's Law. And it's a pretty dense paper, and I want to spare you the details. Um, if you're into it, definitely do read it. Um, but I want to show you a graph, and this is probably the most important graph you might have never seen. What this graph says is a couple of things. The first is, um, Ray was interested in this idea of like how long and how stable are these trends over long periods of time. So we know Moore's Law is 50 years old, but how stable is it over a long period of time? So he took a different calculation. Remember, Moore's Law says number of transistors on a square inch doubles every two years. Now that only works for the period we had transistors, right? So he picked a different number. He said, how many calculations can I perform per second per $1,000 of that year's time? And then he looked at actual data points, and Moore's Law really is the fifth paradigm of computing. Before, that we, before we had integrated circuit, we had transistors. Before transistors, we had tubes. Before tubes, we had electromechanical computing and then elect, um, mechanical computing. And what you'll see is that over 110 years, this trend stays absolutely stable. More importantly, it is also incredibly smooth. The black dots are actual data points. It's a logarithmic chart. So what this tells you is that Despite the fact that we had wars or we had uh, economic up and downturns, massive disruption in our, um, in our geopolitical systems, Moore's Law, the exponential growth curve of Moore's Law stays stable. And when you look, when you squint um, at this graph, you also see that the curve is actually peeling upwards. So this is a logarithmic graph. It should be linear if it's just normal exponential growth. So the rate of change itself is accelerating. The reason why this is important is very simple. You can use this to extrapolate the future. If we believe this graph to be true in the future, and currently there's not a single reason to not believe this, we can calculate the point in time when we have a single computer, a machine, a single machine, which is computationally as smart as a human being, which happens in 2029. So 12 short years from now, we will have a machine which is computationally as smart as a human being. And then it gets interesting. Remember, Moore's Law says every two years we double in capacity. So two years later, we've got two human being brains, computationally, in one machine, then 4, 8, 16. Until 2050, 2060, somewhere around that time point, we will have 7 billion human brains in one single machine. The world tomorrow will look dramatically different than the world today. The world tomorrow will see you having your smartphone being smarter than you are. When you talk to my wife, she will tell you that's true today. <laughs> For me, personally. But well, that's a different story. Now, here's why this is really interesting. So this computing stuff you might know about. It's really interesting because we're seeing these trends in many other industries as well. I want to peel out two industries for you where uh, we see these exponential trends dramatically changing the way you will live your lives as an individual, you will run your businesses, and how the, the geopolitical system will work. Let's talk about energy. Uh, as we're in Texas, um, let me allow you to tell you that this state's uh, uh, main source of income might change. Because energy today is largely carbon-based, of course. It's oil, gas, and coal. Well, the future of this will likely be solar, for a very, very simple reason, cost. So energy cost us, solar cost us, in the 1970s, about $80 a kilowatt hour. To give you a perspective, the cheapest form of energy we have today is coal, dirty coal. It's about 30 cents a kilowatt hour to produce. So this is way too expensive. Ten years later, the price already dropped to roughly $10 a kilowatt hour, still way out of, out of whack. Now, here gets where it gets interesting. 2015, in California, the price dropped for the first time to 30 cents a kilowatt hour. This is unsubsidized, no subsidies. So this is the first time we in California could produce solar energy without subsidies at the same price point as we um, burn coal, gas, or oil. That price point is now true for 30 countries around the world. More importantly, in 2016, the price point dropped to 3 cents a kilowatt hour. 
So Dubai is currently building an 800 megawatt um, powered facility where the price, the internal production price of energy is three cents a kilowatt hour. I'm working with a company called Energy. They were called pre previously RWE, largest energy producer in Europe. Their CEO fundamentally believes that by 2040, they will not sell you electrons anymore. They will give them away for free. They will sell you all kinds of other stuff, for sure, like connectivity, etc. But energy will become free. Now, here's why this is important. A, we fight wars over energy, which is crazy if you think about it as a concept. B, a lot of the problems in the world actually depend on an energy. Think about clean drinking water. If you want to do desalination, desalination is a technology we, we have mastered for years. Problem is, it's incredibly expensive because it's incredibly energy intensive. Once I have free energy, that changes. Another interesting aspect about this is, think about who are the poorest nations in the world and think about how many sunshine hours they have. Right? The world might change. Here's an interesting perspective. What you see here is work from a German PhD. The large square on the left, which is called Welt, is the theoretical size of a solar, powered, solar panel, which we put into sub-Saharan Africa, notwithstanding that you need to transport the energy, which is all it takes to power our energy consumption today for the whole world. We're living in a world where we perceive the world as a world of scarcity, where we build our business models on scarcity, whereas in reality, if we leverage technology, not everywhere, but in some areas, we can actually get to a world of abundance. Here's another example, DNA. And when I talk about DNA, DNA has two aspects. The so one is reading, the other one is writing. So decoding DNA and then changing it. Changing it is something called CRISPR-Cas9. I will not go into those details. I want to talk about sequencing, reading DNA. And again, the reason why this is important and interesting is, again, price performance. So the first time we decoded a full human genome was 1999. It cost us $2.7 billion, seven years of effort. It was called the G Human Genome Project, one single genome, 2.7 billion US dollars. A nation state can do this and they can do it exactly once because it's way too expensive. Guess how much we pay for that same thing today? $18, 18 years later, it's $100. I had to update these slides recently because until two months ago it was $1,000. Now it's $100, sequencing is human genome. Now the interesting thing is when you look at these price performance costs, this is a price performance cost of sequencing genomes, which currently falls at a rate of six times the rate of um, Moore's law. The two questions I always want you to ask when you see these, these performance slides is, where will it go? And when you ask experts, they will tell you human sequencing a genome will become free, or very, very close to free, pennies. And then the second question becomes, what do you do with it? Of course, one thing you do is, we do new drug discovery. We will, um, uh, I can nearly guarantee you, anyone who is below the age of 40, surely your children will not die of cancer. There's absolutely no question in my mind. We will combat cancer. Cancer will be a thing of the past in the next 20 years due to this. The other side of it is technology has an interesting, weird dark side, and I want to make you aware of it. This here is a friend of mine, Heather Dewey Harkboard. She's an artist, artist, based in New York City, and she has an interesting project, and I want to have Heather talk about it herself. We don't know yet how our DNA might be used against us in the future. New York artist Heather Dewey Hagborn. Heather Dewey Hagborn. One artist in New York is making 3D models of people's faces, people that she's never met. She calls the project Stranger Visions. The strangers are people whose genetic material she finds on the sidewalks and subways of New York City. How much can I actually find out about you from something that you accidentally leave behind? So let me briefly unpack what you just saw here. <laughs> so Heather, this is no joke, Heather is picking up cigarette butts on the streets of New York. She finds, she extracts the saliva from this, on the cigarette butt is your saliva, of course. She extracts the DNA out of the saliva, which is something that the FBI is doing for the last 20 years. It's a very known technique. If you watch CSI on television, you know all about that. 
And then she sequences this with a $100 sequencing machine and then works with a very advanced DNA testing lab to reconstruct your facial features because, of course, your facial features are encoded in your DNA. The color of your hair, the shape of your skull, the color of your eyes, etc. She puts that into a 3D model and prints these 3D masks. This is an art project. But think about what this means. Like We're moving into a world where tomorrow will look so dramatically different. The thing which scares me about this is not what Heather is doing. The thing which scares me about this is I show this to politicians all the time. Politicians have no idea. They just don't know about it. So everyone who's currently drinking, uh, let's say, a cup of coffee out of a, a paper um, plastic um, cup or a paper cup, when you throw that cup away, I can sequence your DNA. I can tell you with that DNA, what your percentage chance for you is to get Alzheimer's. I can also send it off to China, who will gladly clone you. We are moving into a world which looks so dramatically different, for good and bad. Right? So here's the challenge. Albert Allen Bartlett, who taught at UC Boulder, was really uh, one of the first persons to really deeply understand these exponential trends, said the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. What he means with that is very, very simple. As we grow up as humans, the world around us, the observable universe, is largely linear. And it's good for us because it's, it's important for us to understand a linear universe. It has something to do with we needed to understand when we see this, when we were on the prairie and we see the sable-toothed tiger at the end of the prairie, we needed to know if we need to run, hide, or attack. Here's a simple example, and you can follow along with this. Imagine you take 30 linear steps, one step after the other, and I'm asking you, how far do you get? You know the answer, right? It's like 30 meters, 30 yards. If I were to go outside with you and say, can you point to the, to the 30 meter mark, you would know pretty uh, exactly where it is. Now, let's take 30 exponential steps. This is what technology looks like, right? It doubles every time period. So 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Do this 30 times. You're smart people. How far do you get? To the moon. Great example. Who said this? How far is it to the moon? Miles or kilometers? Ha <laughs> ha! I gotcha. Sorry. <laughs> so here's the thing. When I do this with an audience, I always get, typically I always get like, uh, someone from the back always yells a mile. For some reason, the human brain goes to a thousand. I have no idea why. It's actually an interesting uh, uh, research subject. And then you've got the people in the first row, and the few people in the first row are like, man, Pascal is hyping these exponentials so much, it must be more. And then someone always says to the moon, and then always ask how far it is to the moon. Well, let me unpack this. It's 25 times around planet Earth. It's a billion meters. It's from here to the moon, back from the moon, and halfway to the moon again. What this demonstrates is two important things. The first is, if you have an exponential trend, it goes to a billion instead of 30. More importantly, and this is the thing which I really want you to understand, is you can't feel it. It's not intuitive. You need to do the math on these things. And it trips us up, because we live in this world where technology moves exponentially. Our thinking is linearly. And in this curve, in these two curves, there's three important points. The first one is this here. Because technology in the beginning moves really slowly, and we tend to be disappointed. Has any one of you worked or seen Google Glass? <laughs> okay, so I was at Google when we released Google Glass. I was working at Google when we did. I was wearing Google Glass for about three months. And um, you all know kind of what Google Glass is or it looks like, I guess, hope. So here's the thing with Google Glass. Google Glass is too expensive, battery life is terrible, functionality is pretty mediocre, and you look like an idiot. <laughs> so you're disappointed. The challenge is when you're disappointed, and you're rightfully disappointed, but the challenge is when you're disappointed, you're dismissing it. The amounts of people I gave Google Glass to and said, try it out, and they took it on, and it's like, this is crap, and it will be crap. But then you get to this moment when Steve Jobs gets on stage and shows you the iPhone for the first time, and suddenly the world realizes a phone isn't a phone anymore. A phone is now a mini computer, it doesn't have buttons, it has glass, and everything changes, and then we get into chaos and amazement. This is where you can't keep up with the change we're seeing in the world. The challenge is, if you're staying on this path, this is your path to doom. This is Nokia, unfortunately. Nokia, make no mistake, here's the deal, right? Nokia was the iPhone. Nokia had the most prestigious, most amazing product on the market before the iPhone. If you wanted to have a cool phone, you bought a Nokia. The iPhone comes out, changes the game. Nokia is gone within three years. The biggest insight I can give you is, and it sounds so trivial, 
But once a technology becomes digitized, it moves on an exponential curve, which means the biggest business opportunities for you is when you find something which you can turn from analog to digital. Silicon Valley currently goes crazy about two interesting industries. The one is healthcare, for obvious reasons, right? It's largely analog, and you can, once you turn it into digital good, it becomes a whole different game. The second one is, and this is pretty, uh, um, probably not quite as well known, is agricultural technology, ag tech. Trillion dollar industry, largely analog. Once you turn that into a digital business, it turns into an exponential. What you have to do is, in this world, you really have to think in 10x and not 10%. Our brain goes to 10% because that's how we were educated, this is how our world works, this is what you're teaching you in business school today, but what you have to do is you need to get to 10x thinking. Because here's the deal, when you do 10x, you actually still think inside of a box. This whole baloney, like, think outside of the box, I'm like, I don't even know how to do this. But if you give me a bigger box, I can play in this bigger box. My bigger box is 10x. And here's why I think this is really important. I can geek out about technology whole day long, and like, you can let me be here on stage for the rest of this conference, and I would love to talk about this stuff, but it really doesn't matter. What matters is the big picture. What matters is that we are living on a planet where it's still like, what, three billion people live on less than two and a half dollars a day, two and a half billion people don't have access to proper um, sanitation, making diarrhea one of the number one killers, there's 800 million people who don't have access to clean drinking water, 757 million people who can't read or write. And despite the fact that all the, the indicators go into the right direction, I think we have our work cut out for us. Albert Einstein once said, we shall require a substantial new manner um, of thinking if mankind is to survive. I read this quote about 25 years ago, and it made me not sleep for a week. Because I was thinking, well, if Einstein says this, there might be something really important here. And the thing which tripped me up was survival, okay? What I think we need to do is we need to think and act big. And I want to introduce you to an interesting uh, case, um, if you want to say so. This is a really dear friend of mine, Nithya Ramamata, and she runs a company called Nextleaf. What Nextleaf tackles is the following problem. About 25% of vaccines in the developing countries spoil because of a break in the cold chain. They get too warm or too cold, and the vaccine becomes ineffective or even uh, dangerous to administer. Problem is, you typically don't know. So the, the nurse in the field doesn't know. When I met Nithya, Nithya um, came with a solution. And the solution looks like this. It's a little black box. Inside of that black box is a cell phone, a $25 Chinese manufactured cell phone, um, about 25 cents of custom-made electronics, and a temperature sensor. You bolt this to the fridge, it travels with the fridge, and now does a couple of interesting things. It tells the nurse via text message in the field if the cold chain was compromised, because this thing stays with the fridge. Secondly, because you get connectivity and GPS for free, because it's part of that phone, it sends the data to the health authorities and tells the health authorities if, uh, if and where these breaks happen, because they typically happen at the same places. It's like, you know, one port where they forget to plug them in, or it's one person who cranks them up too high. So here's the deal what happened with Nithya. When I met Nithya, she had a prototype of this, and I was at Google, uh, back in the day I was at Google.org, and we wrote her a million dollar check and said, go, do this, change the world. Since then, Nithya has collected a little bit more money, and within three years, she's now in six African countries and all of India, and in every single one of those countries, the problem has gone. It doesn't exist anymore. And the sole reason why I'm telling you this, well, two reasons. The one is I want you all to work with Nithya and like give her money and work with her commercially. Um, the second reason, and this is the real reason why I'm telling you this, is everybody can do this. This is not hard. I think once we like, change our minds and like really figure out like what, is, what are the problems we want to solve in the world, we can do this. Even if you can't program, you know, God knows I can't program this thing, you know someone who can. This is not rocket science. I traveled pretty extensively through um, Ethiopia, and in a very remote village in Ethiopia, I took this picture of this little girl. And every time I look at this picture, I'm asking myself a very simple question. This is one question I ask every entrepreneur I work with. I'm asking them, what does it take to make the problem go away? You might have heard Steve Jobs saying, we're here to make a dent in the universe. I don't give a shit about making dance in the universe anymore because our time is running out. We need to change this world. We need to make the problems go away. And I believe that we've got the tools in our hands to do so. I've got the very interesting and weird um, privilege to work with the US Navy SEALs. And the US Navy SEALs have a handbook which they give to baby SEALs, which are the young Navy SEALs. And in this handbook, you'll find a formula 
um, somewhere on the first, in the first couple of pages. And the formula says your rate of growth equals the magnitude of the challenge multiplied by, by the intensity of the attack. What they mean by rate of growth is your personal growth. And what do you care more about than growing? The sole reason why you spend three days here at this conference and not in your businesses or with your families is because you want to grow. So if you believe that to be true, why wouldn't you pick the hardest problem you can find and attack it as hard as you possibly can? Because that's the way you grow. I'll leave you with one last quote. This is my favorite quote um, of the Irish author George Bernard Shaw, who said, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one uh, persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable one, man and woman. I wish for all of you to be unreasonable, um, because that's what it takes to make this world different and change it. We're really at this really interesting intersection point where the lines are crossing. And I get this question a lot, like people ask me all the time, like, what do you think the future will be? And I can tell you one thing, every futurist will lies to you when they say like, they can predict the future, nobody can. I don't know. What I do know is that we are writing this path. We are making those decisions. We decide where those lines go. And it's our responsibility to decide where we want to be. Because if we're not making those choices, we're not making those, those, those hard decisions, we will just become a passive player in a, in a stream of the future. Um, you can all do me one favor, and I give you a gift. All my slides, there's an extended version of this talk on this website. All my slides are there, you can just download them. There's a video version of it. Spread this with everyone you know and you think should know about this, because I believe, fundamentally believe, that the future will look so dramatically different tomorrow than it does today, and we are not yet well prepared for it. And it's an incredible opportunity, don't get me wrong. Uh, I semi-joke, so you might have picked up, I'm not native uh, US uh, citizen, I'm uh, German. And I uh, tell people always that I got kicked out of Germany because I'm too optimistic. <laughs> so I believe that there's an incredible amount of opportunity ahead of us and clearly some, some, some dangers which we need to overcome. Um, with that, um, I wish you uh, a fantastic rest of the conference. I will be with you for the whole rest of the conference. Thank you so much.